Unemployment, bankruptcy, homelessness, a global economic crisis. Should we be optimistic or pessimistic about our global economic recovery? Exploring the impact and seeking solutions? United Nations University presents UNU Conversations, The Economic Crisis. Hello and, and welcome to this edition of the UNU Conversation Series on the Financial Crisis, organized in connection with the June 2009 United Nations Conference on the World Financial and Economic Crisis and its uh, impact on uh, development. I am Jean-Marc Coaco from the United Nations University Office uh, at the UN here in New York. And with us uh, here today, we have uh, Augustin Fossou, who is Deputy Director of the United Nations University World Institute for Development Economics Research, UNU WIDER, based in, um, in uh, Helsinki, Finland. And so today we're going to talk about the effects of the financial crisis, of the economic crisis on, uh, on Africa. So to start with, uh, Augustin, a very simple question. How does the current uh, economic crisis uh, affect Africa? We should begin from the growth side. African countries lately have been doing very well, uh, with GDP growing faster than the world um, over the last several years. So this is really the moment for African countries to begin the process of catching up with the rest of the world. And boom, the crisis arrives. It is also true that African countries have done a very good job recently in terms of translating that growth to poverty reduction. There has been significant reductions in poverty in many African countries uh, since the late 1990s. And again, that was the process of catching up. And the crisis, has, I think, has really dampened those efforts in trying to catch up with the rest of the world. So that's really the, the tragedy right now. The tragedy is that the process has been contravened. That is a major problem, as I see it. So, so, uh, in essence, yeah. so in essence, you are saying that uh, in the past years, in fact, uh, uh, Africa was doing quite well on two fronts. Uh, growth was happening, and perhaps more importantly, this growth was being uh, translated into uh, positive effects uh, as it was reducing uh, poverty. Uh, and, and these are these two good news which, has, which have been hampered by the, the, the current crisis, right? That is indeed quite correct. Yes, indeed. That is a major so, problem. Uh, and so, I mean, uh, when it comes to the, 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 the growth which was happening in Africa uh, in the past years, I mean, two questions. I mean, uh, what was the level of this growth and what were the countries which were the most uh, benefiting from this growth? Actually, that growth was quite wide. It is true that all producing countries in Africa have been doing better than non-oil non exporting countries. However, even the latter set of countries has been doing very well. Uh, one of the things that I've learned uh, in my uh, career here is not to s single out certain African countries. Mm -hmm. Too many countries out there to single out. But what is true is that most African countries were, very, were doing very well. Mm -hmm. Not just on average, but most African countries were doing quite well. And it is not only oil producing countries, but also uh, non-oil exporting countries. And a number of people sometimes argue, well, but it's based upon commodity. Commodities are responsible. The fact that commodity prices have been going up more, recent, more, more recently um, has indeed contributed to the great performance. But it's not all. It is also true that many African countries have put their houses in order. Uh, they have done well in the fiscal area, in terms of in the internal fiscal balance, also external fiscal uh, external balance. Many African countries have done well. Uh, and also in the governance area. African countries today are much better governed than they were back in the 1980s, for, for instance. And that type of performance can support 
great economic performance. So, so in, in, in terms of growth, I mean, you know, since you don't want to single out uh, uh, a given country or given countries, I mean, across the board, what was the, <coughs> the growth rate uh, in the past years? And, and what is this growth rate or no growth rate likely to be uh, in, the, in the upcoming years? So and, and in, 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 in other words, what is the, 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 the difference that we're going to be uh, witnessing uh, uh, due to the crisis? Well, growth rates will probably run in the 6% rate range. Mm -hmm. um, on a per capita basis, we're talking about something close to uh, maybe 4% per year, mm -hmm. uh, which, which is quite high. The problem is that because of the crisis, growth rates have been revised downward. Uh, the most recent projection was about 5%, and now it is down to about maybe 1.5%. Mm -hmm. So you can tell that there has been a major, substantial diminution of the growth rate as a result of the crisis. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely what I mentioned earlier, uh, the fact that this crisis really has been a real bane with respect to the growth uh, process and also poverty reduction process in most African countries. But, but, but uh, with respect to uh, the But precisely yes. in, term, in uh, terms of I mean, poverty reduction, Go ahead, go ahead. With respect, with respect to the poverty reduction, um, you, since the late 1990s, there has been a 1% point reduction in the poverty rate every year. Mm -hmm. Indeed, this rate of reduction is about the same in South Asia, uh, if not even higher. Actually, it is higher than it has been, that it, it has been in South Asia, for instance. Uh, so it's not anything really to, uh, uh, to to sneeze about. So, but precisely in in concrete terms, so uh, how this uh, uh, downgrading, if you will, of of growth uh, uh, for the coming years, how is it? What does it? What, what will be the meaning of this in concrete terms for 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 people in African countries? I mean, how is it going to affect their their, their concrete life and also the ability of uh, of, of these countries to really? Uh, uh, you know, progress over time? Well, definitely with this reduction in the growth rate, it is true that the poverty reduction process that you observed is not going to continue mm -hmm. uh, if this reduction indeed uh, is maintained. It is also true that many people are going to be out of work. Uh, it is quite correct that it may also result uh, in social skirmishes. Uh, it might increase polarization in many of these countries. It might reduce the, uh, it might lead to increasing conflict. As a matter of fact, more recently, the conflict situation seems to have abated, uh, but this may indeed exacerbate a kind of conflict situation. Uh, these are some of the things that we're looking at. The number of post-conflict economies, for instance, uh, whether you talk about Liberia, whether you, you, know, you talk about Sierra Leone, uh, the DRC, a number of these countries were in the process of getting out uh, the, the, the unfortunate conflict situation that you've experienced. They're beginning to do well. Uh, my fear is that because of the reduction in exports uh, from these countries, you know, for instance, um, also on the, uh, on the financial side, but especially on the export side, uh, mm -hmm. you're going to have a situation of reduced fiscal space, uh, of, of reduced policy space, and this can be detrimental uh, to the progress of these countries. So are, are, you, are you saying that uh, it is particularly the uh, uh, countries which are strong in terms of uh, exporting, uh, which are made because of this and because of the crisis particularly vulnerable, or uh, is it uh, also non-exporter countries uh, which are going to be also quite vulnerable? Let's remember that most African countries are exporting countries. Mm -hmm. And so most African countries are going to suffer from the crisis. Let's not make any mistake about that. It is also true that many of these countries do not have the appropriate buffer fiscally. Mm -hmm. For example, international reserves are low. It is true that on average, African countries have done better now than they, they were doing before in many of these areas. But it's also true 
that many African countries do not have the appropriate international reserve buffer to tie them over. It is also correct to indicate that the fiscal space is quite limited. A number of these countries are running fiscal deficit, and they need, do need some support uh, mm -hmm. in, in all these kinds of areas in order to be able to, to get back uh, into the initial process of growth and development. Mm -hmm. so, so when it comes to the financial situation, I mean, as, as I understand you, you are identifying two uh, structural problems, if, if you will, when it comes to uh, uh, domestic governance in these countries, when it comes to when regarding uh, financial issues, the, the, the lack of, uh, of buffer when it comes to reserves, and also uh, uh, a lack of fiscal space. So then my question is, I mean, what kind of policies should we think about and put in place, both at the national level or at the regional level, but also at the international level, to really somehow, for instance, address these two uh, structural uh, uh, shortcomings, uh, lack of uh, buffer in terms of uh, reserves, and uh, a narrow fiscal, fiscal space? Well, first of all, charity begins at home. Mm -hmm. I think African countries, as they've done recently, should continue that process of fiscal prudence, of ensuring that they do not spend too much money they do not have. It is also true that uh, they ought to govern uh, in, in a way so that uh, we do not get back in the debt crisis that we mm -hmm. used to have, uh, which could actually deprive us of uh, social spending. Uh, these are important. The governance situation must also be continued, and the improved governance that we have observed in many of these countries should continue because there's that that will give African countries the endurance to be able to weather many of these crises. Uh, so yes, uh, these are important economic uh, and governance issues that African countries should be involved in. That is on the domestic side. On the international side, first of all, the various commitments that have been made by international entities should be adhered to. If you're to, whether you're talking about the Monterey Consensus, uh, whether you're talking about other kinds of agreement, the Paris Declaration, and so on, uh, with respect to the supply and the quality of aid, um, all these things should be adhered to. We ought to ensure that the crisis do not deprive African countries the appropriate resources to be able to continue growing the economies. Uh, that means that uh, the debt reduction uh, process that, that began uh, should be continued. It also means that we must return to and conclude the Doha Agenda on the development uh, issues, the development agenda, uh, to ensure that African countries can indeed be able to grow the economies, to export their products, and obtain the, the revenues uh, to provide the liquidity uh, for further progress in many of these countries. You talked about uh, fiscal prudence, and uh, uh, it reminded me the expression uh, fiscal discipline, which we have heard a lot over the years. And, and very often, the notion of, uh, uh, of, of uh, fiscal, I mean, the use of the notion of, fisc of fiscal discipline has had the effect of targeting first and foremost uh, social spendings, which are already quite thin or low in, in, in Africa. So does it mean that uh, one of the uh, uh, you know, side effects of the crisis, but also very, very much central for the daily life of people is going to be precisely the, the ability of, uh, of, of, of the African state, of uh, African networks to really look after these uh, social needs uh, in African societies. Social needs, making sure that you satisfy social needs is really critical. That is what development is all about. Mm -hmm. We can grow all we want, but unless we can trans translate that to improvement in social welfare of the people, we've accomplished very little. Mm -hmm. So it, that is very crucial. Uh, that means, for example, that we should try and improve the equality situation, the equity situation in many of these countries. Uh, it also means that we should try not to get back into the old debt crisis situation because a number of studies, and I've contributed to this work uh, most recently, indicate that whenever we, we face these type of external debt constraints, there's a tendency to siphon off funds from the social sector of education uh, and health. 
And so unless we can ensure that we do, we, we do indeed release that constraint, release that constraint to ensure that there's much more uh, fiscal availability uh, for, for a number of these countries, you end up then not being able to improve the social situation, which we must improve as the appropriate objective of development. No, and in fact, uh, it is my understanding that one of the uh, main policy line of UN wider is to try to find ways through which you can dovetail as much as possible growth and precisely issues of uh, of equity, right? I mean, I think it has been your your motto, your mantra for 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 many years, and uh, it's uh, it's very important. But precisely, I mean, what are the chances for this to happen in terms of uh, the current situation? What are the chances for not having uh, social needs being somehow, uh, you know, uh, the, the victim of of the current crisis? Uh, and which leads me to what uh, you, I mean, to the uh, another issue that you alluded to in a, a moment ago, the the international agenda, the Doha agenda. So. First of all, I mean, what are the chances for these social needs to really be viewed as strategic uh, for the future? And how do you uh, look into this, uh, this, uh, this issue in connection with uh, the future of the uh, uh, inter international agenda regarding these issues, including the Doha agenda? Well, if we begin the process of meeting the objective, social ob objectives of development, then it becomes important to look at who are the individuals or groups within countries that benefit from the production, from exports, etc. If, for instance, you have cotton producers in Mali, and I'm going to mention a name right now, mm -hmm. uh, who cannot benefit from the hard work of picking cotton because there are export subsidies such that the price that is um, given to them is too low for them to support themselves economically, then we are failing. Mm -hmm. It is an important international responsibility to ensure that these vulnerable groups, not just countries, but groups, are not hurt by our actions. And this is the, one of the items on the agenda that the Doha Round uh, has been trying to uh, remedy. And we need to get back to the, the, that important issue, we should also ensure that we do have a level playing field uh, for many of these countries, as we've had in the past. And so we must now be more mindful of the adverse implications of the TRIMS and TRIPS. Uh, TRIM is, TRIM, as we know, is pre-related investment measures, uh, which tend to make it quite difficult uh, for developing countries to be able to have industrial policies and trips re relate to trade um, intellectual properties. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's important to ensure that uh, many of these countries can utilize the knowledge that has been created, just like many other countries in the past were able to do, uh, to be able to move forward. And so we must be, uh, again, very mindful that these countries can have to the advantage the use uh, of these resources, both intellectual property and appropriate industrial strategies, uh, so th as opposed to being hampered by the trams and trips. But, but uh, you know, as part of the WTO. Yeah. But the, the do you think that it is going to happen? In other words, I mean, uh, you know, this crisis, is it going to affect uh, uh, positively or negatively uh, the, uh, the, 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 the DOA agenda? I mean, uh, uh, it seems so difficult really to not only uh, reach uh, uh, consensus or convergence on these issues, but then uh, to have uh, deeds matching words. Well, the problem with this crisis is that everyone seems to be suffering. And unfortunately, there's a tendency for individuals to be concerned about their domestic situation. I'm talking to various countries. And in that sense, they may be less willing to give in because of those concerns. However, I think we ought to look beyond the horizon. We should look at the long term, not the short term. And uh, as my colleague indicated some time ago, we all live in this world together, both, uh, and we do have global public goods, 
uh, our interests do indeed intersect. In that sense, we ought to think in the direction of laying the appropriate foundation to ensure that these kinds of uh, uh, benefits are extended to many of these countries. So in the short term, I am not very hopeful. But again, crises have a way of sparing people to action. Mm -hmm. And I hope that as people look around the globe and they see misery in part because of this crisis, that they begin to think that it's about time that we had a greater, more equitable distribution of resources and wealth globally. If people begin to think in this context, then it seems to me that they would bring the long-term uh, type of implementation uh, in operation, and they would move quickly to, uh, to bring back and revisit the agenda uh, and be able to provide what is necessary, the space, policy space, and the fiscal space yeah. for many of these countries to be able to get back on track. F final question before we, we, we end our conversation, because we are running out of time. Uh, uh, I think that you had a chance to, 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 to look at uh, uh, the uh, document which is going to be discussed in the context of this uh, UN World Conference uh, uh, on the Financial Crisis. I mean, what is in store for Africa within the context of this uh, conference? I mean, how is this conference going to help somehow uh, draw a roadmap for Africa and, and for, 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 for progress in Africa? First of all, the, con the conference is going to provide an appropriate forum for people to come in and talk about their respective country situations. I think that is important. Second, uh, there are going to be a number of, uh, of consensus that are reached. Uh, there will be resolutions, and perhaps most importantly, th there should be an implementation of these resolutions. I myself have been familiar with a number of these uh, outcomes, Maybe what they call uh, document outcomes, conference outcome papers, and so on. Uh, in my previous life, I wrote many of those. But again, in the final analysis, how are these documents going to be implemented to benefit society, mm -hmm. to benefit people all across, globally? Mm -hmm. And yes, the draft document that I've seen is well written. It is very comprehensive. But the test is yet to come in terms of its adoption and, more importantly, its implementation. I mean, you know, Augusta, you just mentioned that over the years in your different uh, professional responsibilities, uh, you have uh, uh, been in charge of preparing many of these documents. Uh, so just a personal question, how many of them have been implemented afterwards? Because you're absolutely right. I mean, the bottom line is, you know, implementation. And, and very often, my experience is, but, is that very often, you know, we, 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 we draft these kind of very nice uh, uh, documents. We, we, we deliver these beautiful speeches, and then there is this huge gap between between words, norms, ideals, ideas, and reality. So, and you know, I always go back to the following question, how do we bridge the gap? So, uh, Augustin, how do we bridge the gap? I think we need to take stock. The next time around, we come together, we pose the question, how did we do the last time? How many of the resolutions have been implemented? What is the progress? And then we decide to make sure that we continue with that progress. That's what it takes. Mm -hmm. But let me take an optimistic view here. Even if these resolutions are not implemented immediately, the fact that we have produced knowledge, that we have raised awareness on these issues, sometimes will work behind the scenes to ensure that the long-term outcome will be positive even though in the short term, uh, these objectives may not seem to have been realized. So in the end, you are, you are quite so optimistic. Optimist. So in the end, you are quite optimistic, yes, and, and you are not of the view that uh, somehow we're always uh, one train behind and always running after the train. Not at all. You know, I, I'm also an academic. Mm -hmm. And I do know that uh, when I impart knowledge to my students, it takes many, many years before 
that knowledge comes to fruition. Indeed, most recently, I received some email messages from students I taught about 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and they came back and they said, Professor, thank you very much. What you taught us has indeed helped us, has benefited us. This, you're doing this and that and so on. Thank you very much. So yes, uh, indeed, I'll continue to be optimistic that a lot of these ideas will come to fruition. It is a matter of time. We have to ensure, though, that we can indeed accelerate the process of gestation. Augustin, thank you. So we were having a conversation with uh, Augustin Fossu, who is the deputy director of the United Nations University World Institute for Development Economics Research. I thank you for watching, and uh, I hope to see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>